Hi everyone, this is the recording for the humidification operations lecture 3. So according to the lecture schedule, we have covered the first lecture on basics of humidification and last week we covered the uh, cooling tower design and in this lecture I'll be covering spray chamber design and humidification operations. So without further ado, let's get into the lecture 3 spray chamber design. So the content of this lecture goes as given in the slide. We'll be discussing what adiabatic saturation means and how to design spray chambers and some of the psychrometric operations that we'll be using in this uh, uh, during your humidification operations design calculations. So you have to know that this is the last lecture in this series and in the next lecture we'll be having a tutorial. So first of all, let's get to know what spray chambers are. So during the basics of humidification operations, we discussed uh, cool humidification operations being used for cooling of air and also humidification operations being used for increasing and decreasing the humidity of a certain space. So and in the second lecture, we discuss how humidification operations can be used to cool a, a liquid stream uh, using cooling towers. So in this lecture, we'll be design, we'll be talk, we'll be discussing about a certain kind of equipment uh, that comes under spray chambers, which are used to increase the humidity of air or simply humidification of air. So we discuss certain practical scenarios where we have to increase or decrease humidity, such as in printing operations and in museums to preserve arts, and also in certain cases where you need to stop static electricity being formed etc so you can just go back to the first lecture and or, it's, or search the internet to learn more about uh, what humidification of applications of humidification operations are so if you read the slide i'll okay, again pause the video for a minute and then read the slide okay so if you read the slide uh, it says now our spray chambers are type of equipment that we use to increase the humidity of air and uh, what it is no and it says it normally uses high pressure nozzles to create a fine mist of water or simply spray water into a mist which is then dispersed into air using flans or balls so let's just see from the pictorial diagram that we have on the slide so imagine that you have a water tank here and you have an air space on the top and then you are having you are having an air flow on the top uh, which is uh, forced by either a fan or a blower now what we are going to do is we are going to take this water from the tank and we are going to spray it onto the air flow like this. So the air would be dispersed as a fine mist through these small nozzles at a high pressure and since or because of the small particles it would be dispersed in air and the air would get humidified. So we will be talking about the applications of this and what design can, what uh, physical principles will be here uh, in our spray chambers. So moving on, this is a certain air humidification uh, 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 spray chamber that I have taken from a certain research paper. This is a indicate. This is a humidification system that is being used for uh, to maintain the humid humidity in a mine where you they under they uh, they mine certain minerals underground. So if you can see, we have a water tank here and then water uh, is sprayed through nozzles onto the space and the air is coming in. And if you read the, uh, read, the, read the small names that are there, it says the air flow is here and the air is getting cooled. So through the operation, air is getting cooled. Let's discuss how this happens. And then what happens, what is important is, unlike in the previous cooling tower where we didn't recirculate water, in this what we do is we spray water and then we the water, whatever the water that doesn't get dispersed in air would fall back onto the liquid. And also whatever the liquid coming around this will also then, uh, then uh, recycle back into the uh, water tank. Another important uh, important section in this humidity sorry spray chamber is this 14. You can go one by one and see what these uh, 
elements in the system are so what is one of the most important elements is this 14 which says the eliminator plate so what it does is now certain so as much as uh, the water uh, would be dispersed in air so water vapor would be dispersed in air sometimes it could be there as condensed mist or small water droplets coming with the airflow so if you are going to uh, say use this humidified air stream in a food plant or like a food storage what you have to do is you cannot have liquid water droplets dispersed in air instead we need evaporated water droplets. so in that case what these eliminated plates do is they trap whatever the uh, liquid air particles that would be that would be uh, coming with this uh, airflow so we'll discuss this further when we are uh, talking about a proper uh, spray chamber in the proper spray chamber diagram in the last slide so before moving on to uh, the design mathematics or design equations for spray chamber i need to cover some basic theory so if you remember uh, i in the first first lecture i said there are a few types of temperatures that we talk about so in this case we'll be also talking about a certain temperature so for an instance there was dry bulk temperature we discussed with bulk temperature and then we discussed what dew temperature or the dew point is and now in this uh, this situation we talk about what adiabatic saturation temperature is so for that we have to know what adiabatic saturation is first so moving on uh, you can pause the slide uh, and read what what is there in the slide okay so i hope you paused and uh, read the slide so it says if you remember your thermodynamics the definition of an adiabatic operation so an adiabatic operation is a process that occurs without any transfer of heat with heat between the system and the surrounding so for instance if i say now this is your system boundary you have the system inside and then you have the surrounding or i would say environment outside so for an instance imagine that you have water in this system and an air phase so what will happen is now if you if this water is getting evaporated or vaporized onto the uh, space above without using heat from outside so without using heat from outside that means if you are not heating the system but what happens is now you are using the heat inside water to evaporate so in that case we know the water would get cooled so we discussed this extensively in our first lecture so what an adiabatic operation means this is an example evaporation is an adiabatic operation where water the energy required for the evaporation of water is absorbed from uh, water itself so if you read the slide further it says in an adiabatic process the system is thermally isolated from its surround so no heat can enter or leave the system it's not necessarily no heat can enter or leave the system uh, what happens is actually we we, be, we in theoretically we believe that heat doesn't enter or exit the system but in ideal case scenario there will always be even if we can stop uh, conduction and conviction we never can stop radiation so radiation heat would be there which we assume all the heat transfers are negligible in this case so let me erase this slide and move to the next slide so now that you know what an adiabatic operation is let's discuss how air humidification happens in a typical air humidifier or a spray chamber now same as that before imagine this is your air space and then you have a liquid tank stationary here at the temperature tf so let's see how this happens now imagine your gas uh, flow or the gas coming inside into this space so that we know the glass is blown through a fan or a blower has a y1 temperature y1 humidity and tg1 temperature so what happens is now when the air is flowing through this uh, medium and when we are spraying water from the top so very carefully listen read the slide the latent heat transfer will happen from water to air cooling the water so what happens is we know air is coming out as a mist and some of that air since it's being atomized into small particles uh, small water droplets what will happen is they will evaporate because of high surface area on the drops so for that evaporation it needs some energy it needs the latent heat so what the water droplets would do is it would absorb the heat from the surrounding mist or the liquid that is you know being sprayed 
or the liquid that is coming from here for an exercise there's a small nozzle here when it's been broken into small 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 uh, droplets it would absorb the heat from the nozzle and the nozzle would absorb heat from the water itself so or imagine that you have a uh, let me just get another color so imagine you have a droplet like this and then now it's a small droplet so the surface area is high and when it is coming down it will be small and small and small and what will happen is a certain amount will get operated and will carried with the airflow so now what will happen is to get so if you imagine the mass if you calculate the mass of this and mass of this and if you get the mass difference between these two drops we know the mass difference is the mass of water that got uh, evaporated so for that evaporation it would have it would have absorbed the lambda or the sense sorry the latent heat from this drop and this drop gets cooled as it goes down and it will drop onto the same liquid tank so which is very important and you have to remember so what happens is the latent transfer of heat happens so simply the mass transfer happens uh, from the liquid to the air stream or this liquid to the air stream and we know with the mass transfer where the evaporative mass transfer is happening and with that it helps of the latent heat and the latent heat would be carried from the liquid to the gas so if you see now i have drawn the latent heat transfer so the latent trace has to happen from water to air cooling the liquid so as a side effect of this i said the water cooling happens so again now when the droplets are falling the droplets are colder than the water here and after some what time some time what will happen is this water will also get start getting cold and colder because now water is the water vapors are getting carried on with this air stream and the sensitive heat sorry sensible heat is sorry latent heat is absorbed from the liquid and the cool drops would fall and then the temperature of this would go down and unevaporated water drops uh, what called water droplets fall onto the water tank mixes and homogeneously cools down the liquid in the water tank which is what i explained and then as i said the temperature of this liquid will go down and now due to the temperature difference between the water and air so we know this is coming at tg1 and now this is at a colder temperature so imagine initially this and this both air and water was ever at uh, the same temperature but now what happened now this is at a colder temperature and the incoming air is at the same temperature maybe the air is getting colder here but around the entrance it is still uh, at the same temperature so what will happen is sensible heat will flow into water from cooling air now this is at a high temperature and the liquid is at a low temperature and the sensible heat would start flowing down so initially now if you take it before coming to the steady state if you think about it now your latent heat transfer is happening at a certain rate and your sensible heat transfer is negligible because the driving force for sensible heat transfer is this temperature minus this temperature but now as this cools down the temperature difference between tg1 and tl decreases and sensible heat transfer starts picking up or sensitive rate of sensible heat transfer starts increasing and at the rate where it is equal to uh, latent heat transfer the system will come to a thermal steady state now if you can see now our air stream has got cold why because now initially the latent heat was coming into the air stream but now the sensible heat transfer tra sensible heat tra will transfer from uh, this liquid to the uh, what do you call uh, so, sorry the sensible heat will transfer from air to the liquid stream so energy would be lost from your air because of that your air stream will get cold So we know after some time what will happen is the latent heat transfer and the sensible heat transfer will balances attaining the steady state giving the constant temperature for a liquid. So the liquid temperature would stay constant. So to remind you what steady state means is steady state means the temperature and other parameters do not change with time. So if I take for instance like this point, this point in the airflow, at if I keep the temperature meter at this uh, state initially until it comes to the steady state the temperature will change but when the 
uh, steady state is achieved, it will not change. But if you take, if you consider uh, distance wise, when you are moving from here to here, your state, your temperature would change. But at one point, the temperature wouldn't change with time, which is called, which is called the steady state. So it's in the steady state, the temperature of the liquid will remain constant. And also the temperature of the at the end will remain constant. And this is anyway something that is uh, coming from another process or from atmosphere. So this will be anyway constant. So now we know at the steady state, we know so initially it is coming at y1. And then as the air flow, it's along the air flow, we know the stream gets humidified and our y gets closer and closer to saturation. So because of that, we know since y set now our y at any of this point minus this y or the difference between the humid absolute humidity at any point and the entrance humidity is decreasing along this line because it's getting more and more close to saturation, our driving force for mass transfer will be reduced. So we know our latent heat transfer, which is indicated by orange, is always lambda or the latent heat into uh, latent heat into our uh, mass transfer. So because of that, now our since our mass transfer decreases, the latent heat uh, flow will decrease along the uh, air flow line. So if you can see that. So at this state or the steady state since the air gets saturated along the liquid flow uh, air, rather than saying air gets saturated let's see, yeah let me can say air get more and more saturated the liquid the latent heat transfer gradually decreases along the air flow and now if you consider the sensible heat transfer we know tl is a constant throughout this uh, tank so which means along this air flow our temperature is a constant because air is at a same place and it is being mixed. So generally you can use a mixer in this case as well, but as I said, it's homogeneously, we assume that it's homogeneously mixed. So now our temperature in the tank is TL, it doesn't change, and our, but our Y, sorry, our temperature in the gas stream changes because as it, if you, if you remember what we discussed earlier, so along the line, the air is getting cooled as well because of the heat loss from air to liquid as sensible heat. So if you can see now, uh, so the actually the arrow should be the other way around, these blue arrows, I will correct it and upload. So our sensible heat transfer also decreases because the driving force for sensible heat transfer is TL2 minus Tg at any of this point. We know the Tg is now getting lower and lower. And because of that, the gap between Tg at any point and at this liquid is getting lower and lower and because of this decreases. So it is very important for you to remember. Uh, because of the temperature of the air dropping, because, because since the temperature of the air uh, drops along the airflow, the driving force for sensible heat transfer decreases, decreasing the sensible heat transfer as well. Now, if you consider the uh, energy balance for this entire air space, let's just uh, try to draw a control volume along this air space on the top. We know, uh, so just know that we are using, uh, not we are not using the mass flow rate, so but we can use the mass flow rates as well. So uh, now our uh, air is coming inside at Tg1. So I have used T1 here for the same, and air is going out at Tg2. So we know whatever the sensible heat lost in this air flow is what is uh, used for evaporation of the liquid. So I'm saying again, now whatever the air, yeah, so now our liquid is, uh, so if you consider the, uh, so let me just approach this in another way. Now, if you see this side, it says the energy difference of the air flow. So for an instance, now you are, uh, air flow is coming at Tg1 temperature and it's coming go, going out to Tg2 temperature. So Cs into T1 into T, T2 Tg1 minus Tg2 or uh, now is the temperature, sorry, the energy lost from air. Okay, moving on. So on the right side, no, we know whatever the temperature energy lost from air, okay, would be equal to whatever the energy absorbed by the liquid 
So in this case, we know the energy absorbed by the liquid is the humidity here and humidity here. So now it's coming at y, so y2 humidity, which is higher than y1 humidity. So difference of this gives the amount of water that is went into air space and multiply it by lambda. Now you get the uh, energy that is uh, transferred into the liquid phase from the uh, gas. Phase. So now those two should be equal for the control volume that we are using because we assume it's adiabatic operation. So also one more important thing you have to remember Cs and lambda are defined for unit mass of uh, dry air. So if you want to go with the air flow rate, you have to multiply both sides of this equation by the dry air flow rate, which we assume is the constant. So that's why they have not been mentioned here. So I hope you understood this equation. So if you didn't like, just try to derive this alone and try to understand this properly before moving to the next side, like next side because then it will be very important because this equation is very important uh, for our further calculations. So now let's discuss one of the properties that is uh, one of the properties that we can derive from the previous equation. So if you remember the previous equation for this, which is for any adiabatic operation. So uh, what you can see is now, uh, so we are going to see how the change of humid enthalpy during an adiabatic operation. So if you remember the definition of humid enthalpy, you can go to the first lecture and if you want to, you can just go through it and see. So according to the first lecture, so you are, if your entrance, we say always the entrance is one, the exit is two, exit is two. And you, at your entrance, you are, from the definition of your enthalpy, where T naught is the reference enthalpy, you can write this equation for the entrance. And same way, you can write this equation for the exit, which is uh, the difference between the relevant temperature of the temperature you are considering, the dry bulb, temp dry bulb temperature, and the, uh, that of uh, the reference value, which reference temperature which is normally 25, multiplied by Cs plus lambda into your absolute humidity. Now, if I want to check the enthalpy change, what I'll simply do is I'll, I'll, I'll subtract second enthalpy, the exit enthalpy uh, from the interest enthalpy which gives this equation now if you remember for adiabatic operations we had this equation which is this side is actually this and this side is this so these are two equal parameters and our enthalpy change would become zero so for any adiabatic operation this results tell you the change in humid enthalpy is zero so which means now if you are doing adiabatic adiabatic saturation you can see your enthalpy change is zero. So this is one of the uh, results that you can uh, simply derive from your, uh, what do you call, uh, psychometric chart. Now let me show the psychometric chart. Your Y is here and then your TG is here. So if you remember, our enthalpy lines actually goes like this. So I'm drawing in red the enthalpy line. So now let's just draw adiabatic lines as well. So let's assume that I draw my adiabatic line as, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I can erase this. Okay, I can. So let me draw my adiabatic uh, lines as well. So they should also have a negative gradient if you can remember. Okay, so this is one of my adiabatic lines and this is one of my other adiabatic operation line. Now, just let me get another color. So consider that you are moving adiabatically from this operation to this point to this point okay so now as i said the lines uh, give green lines give the adiabatic operations so if you see now my one of my intel in if in this case when i move from this point to this point or oh, one to two now i am from um, i moved from this enthalpy line to this enthalpy line let me get my uh, list point so from this enthalpy line to this enthalpy line that means there is an enthalpy change in the uh, diagram, which is actually contradicted with the results here. So what it says is, if you are moving a core or moving uh, or moving along an adiabatic operation line, your humid enthalpy change also should be zero. So you must understand by now, which means if I'm going along like a green line, that I can't have an enthalpy change as well. So which in turns mean that 
my enthalpy lines and the adiabatic operation lines are parallel so let me show you again so now imagine my enthalpy lines are my adiabatic lines as well so in that case now this is my uh, enthalpy line and this is my adiabatic lines coinciding so i'm moving from this po first point again to the second point adiabatically which means in green and if you can see my enthalpy doesn't change along that line either so which is a very wonderful result which means our adiabatic uh, operation lines coincide with our enthalpy line coming from this result okay so let's move to the next slide for further to learn about what adiabatic saturation means we talk about how adiabatic operations happens now we are going to talk what is different when adiabatically the system gets saturated okay so now let's see what adiabatic saturation means so imagine if your chamber is very 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 long so usually the chamber should be infinitely long for this to happen but if your chamber is long enough we know our later heat transfer will go go uh, like reduce reduce will keep reducing and our uh, sensible heat transfer will also keep reducing and at some point our ts our system will get saturated so imagine at this point at the here your uh, your air flow has got saturated which means your uh, enthalpy is saturated sorry your absolute humidity is the saturated absolute humidity and in that case so we know our uh, we don't have a uh, from like two if you take two closer points there is no uh, difference in y which means there is no mass transfer that is happening from the liquid to the uh, air flow because the air is saturated. So in that case, there is no latent heat transfer. And if there is no latent heat transfer, our uh, temperature in the air stream would get would stay constant and also equal to the liquid temperature, which is which some simultaneously happens. So if you use process modeling techniques, you can get this scenario for for now just uh, remember that this the, the both happens at the same time and at this situation if your air flow is saturated your water temperature is called the uh, adiabatic saturation temperature which uh, which is the same as our air temperature so in other words what i'm saying is through an adiabatic operation if we can saturate a certain air stream the temperature the minimum temperature it would reach at saturation is called the adiabatic saturation temperature and uh, humidity which uh, that would it reach is called the adiabatic saturation humidity now what you have to remember is now this tg uh t so if you can see this tg temperature imagine so it's coming at uh, say like uh, 35 celsius so we know for 35 celsius there is an equilibrium absolute humidity for saturation for 35 celsius there is a saturation uh, humidity but in fact what has happened is we have not it's not that we have reached that humidity because now along the stream the leak the the gas stream is getting cooled so because of the, the temperature drops so the uh, saturation humidity that it can reach also drops so what has happened is now our system has adiabatically saturated uh, to adiabatic saturation humidity which is the equilibrium humidity at t as or adiabatic saturation temperature and the liquid also automatically comes to the same temperature so for that to happen actually your uh, tower should be infinitely long so which in case uh, we believe that uh, it's not possible but we assume in that we so what we do is we simply assume that our system has come to a uh, adiabatic saturation condition now if your chamber is long enough the air will get almost saturated after that's why i use the word almost saturated after some point uh, on the flow and there will be no more latent heat transfer or sensible heat transfer at the steady state so if you remember the previous equation we had y2 here for adiabatic operation and tg2 here in this case now our exit uh, humidity is yas and the temperature is tas and now we have this equation so imagine now if you want to find this TAS and TYAS in our uh, what you call a psychometric chart. So that's what we are going to check next. 
So how we find P A S is actually using T W scale same as T W scale. Let's see why we are using the both because now we know if we have too many parameters in our psychometric chart, it's going to get very complicated. So let's see how we are going to determine T A S using T W. Now we know the equation for uh, T A S or so adiabatic saturation temperature. I have arranged it in a different way. Uh, it is T G minus T S, the same equation as previous. Uh, and uh, uh, so the intercept is uh, C S over lambda, which I have taken the other way. And this is the equation. And if you remember, or if you don't remember, you can always go to the first lecture and see the equation for your wet bulb temperature. So if you remember the wet bulb temperature equation, it has the same format. So the only difference is the intercept is different. And in this case, we have T A S, T W, and T A S and T A R, T by, T by S. So for water, if you remember, uh, we know our saturation. The the we go talk about something called psychrometric ratio, which is this ratio H C versus H C over C S, uh, K Y. So you know the definitions of these terms. Which is it, and for water water air systems we know this uh, psychrometric ratio is in in uh, definitions it's one. So now if you consider uh, just you have to do the calculation alone and uh, if you substitute say uh, for an instance if you substitute for C S or K Y over H S from K Y over H C from this equation you will realize. You can end up you will end up with this equation where adiabatic saturation is same as your wet bulb temperature so which kind of makes sense as well because if you remember your wet bulb temperature it has the same principles as well but in fact it's a little bit different but uh, you don't have to get into that deep uh, theory so for now remember your adiabatic saturation and the adiabatic saturation temperature and the wet bulb temperature are the same value so it says hence for water air systems adiabatic temperature can be read as the wet bulb temperature as well so now that we have covered the basic theory behind adiabatic saturation we can move into spray chamber design so uh, i have included this slide for you to understand what a spray chamber looks like and the simple notations so if you can see we have the water tank here and then the water is being sprayed through the nozzles continuously and the airflow goes like this and uh, one of the most important things that you have to remember is now our spray chamber should be infinitely long for our output to be completely adiabatically saturated uh, but in fact what we do is uh, in spray chamber equation derivations we assume that our uh, final air stream is close to saturation so because of that uh, like very careful listen you have to as you can assume that your liquid and the air both this tg2 and the liquid temperature tl are both equal to adiabatic saturation temperature okay so now one of the other properties is so we learned that our humid enthalpy in an adiabatic adiabatic operation it doesn't change so because of that our input humid enthalpy would be same as our output enthalpy. so in the previous cooling tower design we had this equation for cooling tower operation line operating line so what we are trying to do here is uh, in this slide we are trying to see whether the same theory that the same equation that we use to calculate the height of our cooling tower are applicable in the design or when determining the length of our spray chamber now so look at this operating equation line sorry operating line for our cooling tower now if you remember our cooling tower operating line it relates our conditions in the bulb for instance the humid enthalpy in the air stream as well as our liquid temperature to the bottom conditions again your hg1 and uh, tl1 are bottom conditions uh, so but if you remember our diagram for a uh, spray chamber now there is a problem what is the problem we if you consider our liquid temperature since we use one stationary water tank our, and it's been uh, what do you call uh, perfectly mixed 
uh, our liquid temperature is same at the place where our air is introduced and also at the place where our air leaves so tl1 tl2 are both equal to the say are, are equal to each other as well as it is equal to the temperature throughout the air stream as in like the liquid temperature in contact with the uh, air stream throughout the air stream on the other uh, hand we also assume that it is almost equal to saturated adiabatic saturation temperature so because of that our tl in fact doesn't change throughout uh, our uh, spray chamber and moving on for adiabatic mixing or adiabatic operations we also know our uh, humid enthalpy doesn't change so in that case now if our humid enthalpy is hg we know at the entrance and at the exit our humid enthalpy doesn't change so it will have the same value so if you remember our uh, how we when we plot our operating line so we plot the first point in the operating line as tl1 and hg1 and the last point in our operating line as tl2 and hg2 and this is for our cooling tower design but in this case if you see our first point and the second last point actually coincide into one point because it's the now our temperature through our liquid temperature throughout our column is tas and our enthalpy throughout our column is also so not column so the spray chamber is also hg or hg1 so if you see the coordinates of both entrance and the exit of our uh, chamber would be this and so this means it reduces the entire operating line to one point making the previous Heist equation invalid okay so now if you remember our cooling tower plot this is how it goes and this is what the interface line is uh, x-axis is tl and the y-axis is hg and uh, in this case we know our only one point is tas and hg1 and if you draw the interface bulk line you get a line like this and our difference of enthalpy would be so we always take hi minus hg so in this case we'll have only one value for hi minus hg that means we can't calculate an area because the hi minus hg value doesn't change in throughout our cooling tower so because of that this value would remain constant and that means you can't calculate a uh, cooling tower uh, value cooling tower uh, what do you call cooling tower height or the cooling tower sorry you can't try you can't calculate the spray chamber length using this equation So this is what I meant. I just drew a crossover it. So now we need to derive an equation in order to find the uh, uh, cooling tower height. So this is a pretty simple equation and the sum of the simple derivation we did in the previous lecture as well for your reference. And also this, refer this, de this derivation is also only given for your reference. You don't have to remember the equations or the derivation. So now, if you remember, now this I have used the same diagram here as well, so it's not actually packing. But if you consider a differential length of your uh, cooling, sorry, uh, spray chamber, if you consider the mass flow from the liquid phase to the gas phase, uh, can be calculated using the changes in the uh, mass of gas. Now your gas is coming at G flow rate and it's going out G plus G dash flow rate. So if you subtract, your mass flow rate will be D g and if you remember the definition for your g it's g dash plus y g dash i'm not going to explain this further if you want to refer you can refer to the previous lecture so now i get the equation that my dg is equal to g dash dy that means my mass flow rate is equal to g dash gy g dash dy and now if you consider the uh, other type of theory that we can use so we introduced the uh, theory with this theory of mass balance and now we are going to use the theory of mass transfer so now we are going to have the same uh, property using mass transfer equation so if you remember your mass transfer values in this case it would be mass transfer coefficient into this uh, area the elemental area available for uh, the area available for heat and sorry, mass transfer in your uh, elemental uh, unit that you consider 
and also this would be interface uh, absolute uh, interface absolute humidity minus the absolute humidity in your bulk air so now since water in our case is a TASO now in our uh, spray chamber our water is approximately at adiabatic saturation temperature so in that case uh, you are, we know if you have water now like so this is the so let me just draw uh, water with blue color so if i draw water now this is my physical boundary and next to physical boundary i always know my interface is we consider it as saturated now if my interface is saturated and my temperature of water is tas that means on the surface of water my uh, absolute humidity would be yas or absolute humidity at adiabatic saturation which we discussed earlier so in that case what we can do is we can replace this term with absolute humidity at adiabatic saturation so let me uh, erase all the annotations and move to the next slide okay so moving on this is a summary of what we have derived so far we derived the uh, mass transfer rate using uh, the mass difference or the mass balance equation theory of mass balance and then from our uh, theory in mass transfer we derive this equation so we simply know since there is no mass loss we can equate these two and i get this equation so if you carefully look at this equation i have the differential element dy which is the difference in absolute humidity and i have the differential differential uh, term dz which is the uh, in the case of spray chamber it would be the differential length not differential height now if i rearrange this equation let me go to the next slide so this is the equation we derived earlier and if i rearrange to subject dz unlike in the previous case where my interface conditions didn't change so if you remember in the previous case i had why I here and throughout my tower, my interface condition changed. But fortunately, in the spray chamber, since our water is at T, uh, at T adiabatic saturation throughout, our T A Y A S doesn't change. So because of that, I can consider all these terms except this Y as a constant, and then I can integrate from whatever the humidity I want to whatever the humidity. Uh, my exit is sorry, whatever my whatever the humidity of my entrance air to whatever the humidity I want in the spray chamber and then I can uh, integrate this from my zero to uh, the length that I want to go and the simple equation would be this so something very important is we assume that water is almost at adiabatic saturation temperature which means this equation would be accurate only when my y2 would be closer to adiabatic saturation uh, value so as in as as long as y2 and ys are called so the as soon as as long as my y2 is close to yas this equation would be valid that would be more accurate and as my y2 is deviating from yas my e the equation would be more and more inaccurate so this is a question that i have included from uh, professor padma's tutorial uh, a few years ago so what you can do is until i upload uh, the tutorial that is made by me uh, you can try out this question and also if you have any problems you can come to the uh, tutorial session uh, uh, from this question and from the tutorial okay so now that we have discussed the theory behind uh, design equation so i have the spray chamber component so this is a diagram that i actually uh, found from uh, professor padma's lecture so i believe this diagram is from the reference book from table mass trans operation mass and heat trans operations so now just look at this uh, spray chamber component so first of all you have the blower here which actually sucks air in sucks air from the fresh air and then uh, it goes through this uh, spray chamber operations and goes out of this air outlet so fresh air is coming in and you always have a filter because uh, it's simply uh, as in like a precaution where you have dust and other particles uh, that would be trapped here because if you are pumping this humid air into humid air from this uh, spray chamber into a food operation we can't have dust there sometimes we have for instance when you go to a uh, 
uh, an ice cream factory where you have openly uh, making ice cream uh, popsicles uh, you have you can't have dust in the air because that would get uh, that would uh, go into our product contaminated so now the filtered air would be heated using steam coil so i will come to i'll describe describe why we heat air so which is uh, important uh, but what we get in the next slide so for now just see that we are heating air and then we have the uh, water circulation where the spray chambers are there where the spray chamber is here and the water will be sprayed and then i discuss about this entrainment element eliminators which reduces which uh, eliminates whatever the liquid uh, water particles in this air which have not been evaporated which means which are not in the gaseous phase and then we again heat the uh, air this is actually an option, optional operation let's discuss why we are doing this as well uh, when you go to the next slide and the air humid air coming from this would go to whatever our operation is so moving on this is the spray chamber that we have so on the same spray chamber diagram and here we have whatever happening along the length of your spray chamber now if you see now your fresh air is here so what happens is now if you see our uh, if you remember our adiabatic line or the wet bulb temperature line actually goes like this so which are parallel uh, sorry let me just uh, draw them so my wet bulb temperature i'll describe why now this is one of my uh, oh my god okay so this is one of my uh, adiabatic uh, line here and then for this point i can draw something like parallel line here i am pretty bad drawing so forgive me for that and then i have the outer tear here for that as well I'll draw a line, parallel line. So we have three adiabatic lines, or in other words, we have three uh, wet bulb, temp wet bulb temperature lines here. So now, if you consider your uh, fresh air, so now fresh air is here. So if you see now, if my fresh air is almost closer to this is the hundred percent saturation line, almost close to the hundred percent saturation line, that means the amount of uh, water vapor that I can add into this air is very small because it's almost a saturation. So what I do is, uh, so as I said now, uh, what I can do is if I heat this air using this steam coil, what I can do is I can bring the, bring my inlet air to this point. So now if I send it through my spray chamber, what I can do is I can humidify up to this level. We know I can never go to 100% humid saturation because that would need a infinitely long spray chamber so and then what i do is now but again the problem is if i input this air directly into my uh, uh, whatever the application it's almost at the saturation so just a small temperature drop could start making water on my surfaces in my storage so the problem with that is now when the water is accumulated everywhere there is a chance for microbial growth and other complications so i can i might contaminate my products i might have microbial growth etc so to avoid that what i do is i again reheat the steam which is actually optional uh, it depends on the point that you go to if i store up around here my uh, spray chamber operation then i can i don't have to do it if you can see but if i do this optional heating now my air is here which has enough space for saturation sorry enough space for saturation that means it won't condense right so now let's just see how my uh, amount of uh, heat added uh, amount of water vapor added in this operation uh, so now my inlet air was here okay and then if i read the absolute humidity here and now if i directly directly uh, blow it into my spray chamber this is the amount of humidification that i can actually do which is very small now after heating and when i do the humidification now you see this is the amount of water vapor i can add which is a lot right now i have reheated it but imagine that some now your this humidity the absolute humidity in the air is not enough so what i can do is i can again go with another spray chamber in series and bring it to here and then now my new absolute humidity would be here and this is the amount of uh, water vapor i added so i can just keep doing this 
if you see if you have uh, say like few heat uh, spray chambers you what you do is you spray you introduce the spray chamber and you heat you spray the heat chamber you heat so but, and uh, one thing that you have to remember is now when you are when you are uh, your initial temperature was let me take a different color was here right this is the temperature of air and then now uh, when i'm when i'm humidifying or when i'm adiabatically mixing with uh, what you call my uh, uh, what adiabatically mixing in the adiabatically mix air with water spray in my uh, spray chamber my temperature actually drops so how it doesn't matter how much i heat my temperature would actually drop from here to here because the cooling happens simultaneously with the humidification so let me erase this uh, diagram okay so let's move on to the last part of our lecture different psychometric operations so this is our last part of the lecture different types of psychometric operations now let's discuss the different types of psychometric operations that we can do in and like let's try to mark them in our humidification or psychometric chart so now first of all what we are covering is cooling or heating externally with no contact of water for instance imagine that you have a water vapor so you have a, a room where you don't have water in touch with your air you simply cool it or heat it so let's just see how uh, cooling would go sorry so this is the point that i'm in right now and let's see how our cool heating would first go so if i'm heating my uh, i simply increase the dye bulb temperature and since there is no water in contact my absolute humidity doesn't change so it goes along the absolute humidity line and it will keep going this way until it uh, it actually can go to whatever the temperature it wants but the cooling is actually different so imagine that i'm cooling the liquid here so this is what my cooling would be following now it would go uh, the it would go along the same uh, absolute humidity line until it reaches the saturation and after that you know we can't cool further without keeping the same uh, absolute humidity or same water content in that case because now our space is saturated you have to uh, if you try to cool further what will happen is your water will uh, get water will start uh, getting condensed and it would move along the 100% saturation line which we actually discussed in our first lecture as well so one of the application of this operation is we can dehumidify air by cooling operations so imagine now you are at this point at this temperature and you are you are what you call uh, your absolute humidity is uh, let me just take a different color now absolute humidity is this value but i want to now drop my absolute humidity this value but i want the same temperature so what i can do is now this is the point that i should come back to what i can do is i can cool 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 and after saturation also cool 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 and then at this point i'm not sure whether it's the right point but i can come here by heating okay so i don't think this is this should be a straight line so i hope you understand why so this is how you humidify uh dehumidify using cooling so you simply what you did this in overall you came from this point to this point okay so let's move to the next slide okay so now it's a different application so we are cooling or heating adiabatically so what you do is you don't heat or cool from outside what you do is you just keep in contact with water so we know our adiabatic operation lines are same as our wet bulb temperature lines or our enthalpy lines so what happens is we have the enthalpy or the wet bulb temperature scale here and this is the point that i'm here where i'm right now i'm at right now and it would simply if i try to heat it would go along this line what will happen is my absolute humidity uh, should decrease uh, so but what but the problem is now we know how the direction of mass and heat transfer only favors cooling so this is actually the other way so adiabatic operation can be must can can go along this way but it is not entropically feasible or the delta g for this process is not uh, it's actually uh, positive because of that this doesn't happen but we can always do cooling because our uh, driving force for heat and mass transfer lies in favor of cooling 
so this is what it would look like so you can have you can't actually go to 100 percent humidity as i mentioned you might need uh, you might need infinite time uh, for that you will have to uh, it will take a very long time because once what happens is now when you are when you are reaching to 100 percent humidity your mass transfer rate actually decreases and decreases and it goes to it is actually become an asymptote because of that uh, asymptote to y-axis for instance let me just draw it and show you now imagine that this is your uh, mass transfer rate which is actually directly proportional to we know uh, the humidity in the place minus sorry uh, the saturation humidity at the average saturation humidity over humidity we know when we are moving towards it this value actually decreases and decreases and because of this decreases but it would actually grow for something like this now my uh, this line uh, so what i'm doing is it could be time it could be in a spray chamber it could be length so you can derive it accordingly but uh, now you have to understand what i'm saying is now your mass transfer rate would actually decrease and decrease and it will never it will never go to zero but at infinite time only it will go to zero where we achieve the adiabatic saturation condition so but in fact this is the more this is what we use for our uh, spray chamber uh, theory sorry spray chamber of applications and now if you read the slide it says the air can be cooled and humidified naturally in contact with water now uh, what you can do is for an instance imagine that you are here uh, i'll take the same example now if you want to move to uh, this you want to humidify up to this but the thing is now to directly move from here to here what you can do you can't directly add uh, water because when you are adding water your uh, temperature would also change as like when you are when the operation is happening temperature would change so what you then do is you can simply keep it contact with water or simply what i'm saying is send it through a, a spray chamber and move to this point where it is cooled and humidified and then heat your system externally up to this point so that you have moved from this point to this point okay so that's what cooling and heating adiabatically with water contacts now our next uh, point is cooling and heating with externally with water contact now you have water as well and you are performing a cooling or heating so this is something that is not very uh, i would say uh, natural so you don't do the same to i said you don't do the external heating and keep the contact as well but there is something called uh, uh, boiling uh, what do you call boiling humidifier or the vaporization humidifier where you boil water and then go then do this so which is uh, kind of different uh something similar to this yeah, that we are doing so if you want to you can search about it or like simply in chat gtv just uh, type uh, the types of uh, uh yeah humidifiers that are there in industry so you can read them about read uh, read in chat gtp to explain better you can keep asking questions to explain it more and more so see now you are at this point and we know if it's adiabatic uh, conditions you would be moving along one of these adiabatic lines right but since now there is an external external uh, heat exchange that means we won't be moving along this and see if you want to heat you can simply what you can do is you can increase the temperature and also the water would also get evaporate and now if you can see my humidity is also increasing and my temperature is also increasing if you want to cool and also at the same time spray it would go along this kind of line where my cooling happens where my uh, dye bulb temperature decreases but my absolute humidity increases so this is just a random operation that you can just see and if you are supposed to draw it you can draw it on a psychrometric chart so you might get something like this for quiz uh, let's see uh, just make sure that you are you know what this uh, operation means on a psychrometric chart and how the arrows goes okay finally something uh, called adiabatic mystic so imagine that you have two uh, streams so you have one stream of water one stream of air that you are mixing with another stream of air in a space so we know that as if you assume there is no heat going in or out of the system which is the normal case uh, where whatever the heat from say this is at a high temperature and this uh, humid volume is at a uh, low temperature okay 
so when you mix them what will happen is they would mix and they would come into an intermediate temperature with the intermediate humidity intermediate excentility etc which is we call adiabatic mixing where we assume there's no heat is uh, absorbed in or taken out of the system so let me raise this sketch here and let's see how we are going to denote it in the uh, psychrometric chart now you are imagine these are the two points and uh, so this is something very similar to uh, something that you have learned in your distillation as well the lever rule in your phase diagram so this is also in in fact your psychrometric chart is also phase diagram right so what happens is when you mix uh, a mix these two air uh, these two air conditions it would actually lie in a point between these two uh, if you draw a straight line between these two your point would lie on some point on the straight line so we know uh, all these operations are de defined for one kilogram of dry air so what you can do is if you can use the lever rule based on your amount of air in the system you can define you can define where your operating point is for an instance imagine now you are this is uh, now uh, this is uh, one kilo of air and this is two kilo of air so you know how to use the lever rule and then you can find this point based on lever rule using these and the other properties as well so adiabatic oh, you can simply use the design equations as well so we'll try to do a calculation from this as well for your understanding of adiabatic mixing so this is the question on adiabatic mixing uh, and uh, what you can do is you can try out this question through label rule as well as simple uh, mass balance or in another way what you can do is you can simply derive the mass balance equation uh, in general and then maybe derive how it relates to lever rule as well so what you can do is you can try out this question as well come with both results for the tutorial section uh, which would be our next session so just like in the previous lecture i have included three homeworks for this lecture as well which should be uploaded to the model as i said this not be evaluated but i'll be checking who would be uploading and following the lectures so the first two uh, questions uh, first two homeworks are to ask the questions that are already on the slides and you can try it and then uh, upload to the model and uh, what one point on the homework is you don't have to do them in order you can do whatever you like and whatever you think uh, is uh, more important to you and depending on the time you have as well so the last homework is something very important i want you to write short paper so i think uh, around five to six pages would be enough i don't have a page limitation you can even submit one paper one page but it's up to you it's simply to do some uh, research and uh, read some websites and literature and you can simply use chat gtp for this segment as well so but uh, just be mindful that chat gtp could be wrong sometimes so to describe further uh, so you are supposed to write a short paper on cooling water systems and type of cooling towels and uh, so what the task is to create a summary of uh, summary document on the given topics individually or you can do it in pairs or you can do it in groups uh, if you are doing it in pairs or groups make sure that you include your index number in the first slide so uh, you don't have to just make a word document you can make a, a, a powerpoint and then maybe convert into pdf and upload as well uh, so it's completely up to you very open-ended and then uh, you are supposed to do a very brief explanations uh, are enough for so okay so, so very brief explanations are enough for each of the topics here and wherever uh, possible include diagrams in, uh, instead of uh, uh, explanations and the document can be either handwritten or computer compiled and one more important thing is don't spend more than six hours so if you are doing individually you can do spend the six hours individually or you can if you're doing pairs three and three and three if you're doing three people you can do like two and two and two so whatever it is like make sure that you don't spend more than six hours so up to you how the work that you do would uh, actually uh, will be rewarded during exams and the quizzes so and then uh, for three hours uh, just do the searching and three hours for writing and as i said the assignments is not evaluated let me explain the assignment further in the next time. so you have uh, uh, you have to write the short paper on cooling water systems and humidification operations 
and uh, so it should include the types of cooling mode systems i have given the subtopics to make it easy for you and the type of equipments using humidification operation so we covered two types of equipment spray chambers and uh, cooling tower so you can uh, include them and one more and also explain very briefly like how they work etc and or maybe like what the design intent would be and what is the application etc so don't uh, explain too much uh, because uh, it, i mean uh, if you want to explain too much you can but uh, make sure that you read a lot rather than explaining a lot in the uh, what do you call in your whatever the paper and then finally the problem associated with the design operation and maintenance in the humidification operations so one more point i want to highlight is so if you see some kind of a mistake in my slides because i made the slides for your batch for the first time make sure that you let me know during the lecture or you can send me an email or when i'm in the department uh, please let me know because uh, i went through the slide and sometimes i notice certain uh, changes as well so uh, it would be a huge favor for me if you can do that thank you before ending our third lecture i would like to remind you few things including the tutorial that is scheduled uh, for uh, next week so what you can do is you can try out the questions from lecture 1 lecture 2 and lecture 3 i have uploaded two uh, tutorials so far so soon i will upload the tutorial for this uh, section as well so try out all the questions and then come to the class with your answers and i have opened a module submission box for your tutorial answers so at least try out few questions and upload what you have tried out there and uh, so what I'm saying is, if you haven't tried out questions, uh, just uh, there's no point in coming to the tutorial session. So unless you have not tried out questions, so just don't come to the tutorial session because I will not be discussing each and every question from top to the bottom because it will be a waste of time for you and me both. So try out the questions again and come to the class with your answers. So this is the end of our uh, lecture three and you can go through the material that i have uploaded in the module uh, and as well as the, try the questions and we'll meet in the tutorial session so thank you for listening uh, and have a good day